Y'all are good. Y'all are good. What's up, McCullies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. All right, good morning, Christ Community Church. It is good to see you today. Uh, my name is one of the pastors here. If you are new and visiting either in person or online, uh, we, are, we are so glad you're visiting with us. We'd love to know if you're here. We want to say hi, uh, but we'd welcome card. We have welcome cards outside this door downstairs, or we have it where you can text to get a welcome card. Just text the number 1000 and type in CS and it will get you a welcome card. And we like to get those uh, so that we can send you a quick email just saying more of who we are, what we're about, how to get plugged in, things of that nature. That number can also get you the bulletin. So if you text the number 94000, and you text the word bulletin, it'll give you the bulletin of upcoming events, information, and, and all that jazz. A couple things coming up today, we have what we call the next meeting. The next step meeting is a luncheon. It's going to be at my house. Uh, so if you, the, if you think that you have ready, uh, I'll be leaving after the service if you need to out there. Uh, we have food out there waiting on us. But the next step class is essentially a class to learn a little bit more about each other, but also more about the values of our church. What do we believe? How do we, how do we behave at our church and what, what, what that's about? It's just kind of answer if you're curious about who we are. It's also f the next step of membership. And I uh, always like to say there, we are a church that believes in covenant membership. What that means is that we are a church where the membership is crucially important to who we are. Uh, we believe that we need to be known by the body of Christ and that the body of Christ know us. And that can happen if we know like who's in our membership. One of the things that we never want to get to is where we have this huge, man, we've got a thousand people and we only know like 50. Uh, so what we want to do is know who each other are, uh, so it's important to who we are. So the way we do that is the next step is the next step luncheon, and then we have things of our covenant. We'll read through that, and if you still part of us uh, after all that, uh, you can talk with an elder. Uh, I'm an elder. Neil Grogan's an elder. Jeremiah Walker's an elder. I just like to hear your testimony because we believe that being a part of the church at the very base level means that you're a follower of Christ. So we'd like to hear how that life. And then we do this awkward thing where we sign the covenant saying, this is how I agree to live uh, with you, which is essentially a, a summary of scripture. And then we do the awkward thing in a member's meeting. And someone says, Stephen, why do y'all still do that? Isn't that kind of like archaic and old? It's good. I think it's symbolic uh, because of a church, the community of Christ, looking at somebody saying, I am responsible now for that person. And it's that person who's joining a church, looking over the membership, saying, I'm now responsible for these people, because uh, that's what is. So if you'd like to be a member, the next step is that next step class. Uh, we did order a few extra sandwiches. So if you're like, man, I didn't RSVP and you want to go, uh, holler and, and we've got space for you. All right. Also, have second. 
Uh, May 22nd, we'll go over across the street to where we're building a church, and we have a few projects that we're going to be working on. Uh, so we invite you to join us for that. Let's go ahead and stand call to worship. It says, I will thank the Lord with all of I will declare all of your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, Most High. All right, so uh, a couple weeks ago we learned a new song called Behold Our God. Um, and there was this part that we sang um, towards the end in the bridge. We all sang You Will Reign Forever last time. We're going to progressively like get more where everybody's singing things. So... Um, this week, the men are going to sing, you will reign forever, and the women will sing, let your glory fill the earth. So we're going to show you what it looks like, and then uh, we're going to sing them because they kind of go on top of each other. So sing it a few times. So. The men sing, you will reign glory fill the earth. Let your glory fill the earth. Let your glory fill the earth, reign forever. So let's do it one more time, Stevie. Can you go back again? <laughs> there we go. So sing. Let your glory fill the earth. Let your glory. your glory fill the earth. Let your glory fill the earth. Reign forever. All right. Let's try it out. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold, our God seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold. Our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore. Who has given? Teach the one who knows all things, who can fathom all his teachings. Behold, our God seated on his throne. Come, let us adore. Who has felt? Who felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold, our God, seated on His throne, God, 
Thy strength indeed is small, child of weak, watch and pray, find in me and all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him. Sin had left a crimson stain. He did white as snow. Lord, now did I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of. Jesus paid it all, all to my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save my little peace. He did it all, all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain. He walked white as snow. Sin had left a stain. He washed it as snow. He washed it white as snow. He walked white as snow. Oh, praise the Paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Hope who paid my debt, raised life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, the one who. And raise this. 
this life out and oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised me up from the oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the Praise the one who paid my debt and raised my life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up. You may be seated. morning christ community church in psalm 32 3 through 5 the psalmist says, i kept silent my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy on me my strength was drained as in the summer's heat Salah. then i acknowledged my sin to the lord and you did not conceal my iniquity i said i will confess my transgressions to the lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. if you ever stop to think about how short our attention span Quickly, our memory fades from one seemingly crisis to the next. If I were to have you ask anybody in this area about I guarantee you most people would at least go back to a few weeks ago, almost a month and a half ago, when we had freezing temperatures in Texas. But I bet many people would forget about the days and days last August when we had record-setting heat and lack of rainfall when everything you wanted was just to have November get here quickly so you could have a final break from that heat. You know, our lives are kind of like that. We get lost in our own lives. We get beat down by the circumstances of this life, and that oppressive heat can lead us to take actions that we don't aren't proud of, things like that, and we end up maybe wandering off the path that God has set before us. And that guilt of our sin upon us just like that summer heat that's soon approaching and just swelters and beats you down, and before you know you don't know where to look, and the only thing that will satisfy you is something cold to drink, and you see nothing around but desert. But I want you to remember, Christ Community Church, that God is faithful to provide that respite from you. If you pray and repent of your sins to him, he is faithful to give you that drink of sweet tea in August when you need it more or the power and heat in February, but that's a different, that's a different message. Uh, but that being said, I want you to take and go through your heart, search your heart out, and if there's any sin to him, take a moment and bring those before him and he's promised to give you respite from that. How joyful is the one whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is this person whom the Lord does not change with iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being willing to put up with our continuing straying from your path, Lord, and being faithful to you without punishment, Lord, for you've paid that punishment through your actions on the cross. Thank you so much that you have given us the assurance of your pardon, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, as we move into this time of communion, I want to invite all of you who are members of Christ's body and as part of the church, not necessarily members of this church, but if you're a born-again believer and a member of the Universal Church of Jesus Christ, then that is whom this ceremony is about. We take communion, the Lord's Supper, as a testament to the things not only that Christ has done in the past, but more as a promise to what he has promised to do for us in the future with his second coming. So, in the 
first century when Jesus is eating the supper with his disciples, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke This is my body broken for you. Eat this and do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after he blessed it and said, this is the new covenant in my blood given the shed for your sins. And Paul reminds us that as often bread and we drink this cup, that we are proclaiming not only the Lord's death, but also proclaiming to come back and bring a new life back to us once he returns a second time. A believer in Jesus Christ, we offer that we want you to join us in this communion. But if you're just here visiting or you're not sure about what this is about, then I would ask you just to abstain and think about the things we're talking about because, again, this is a symbol, uh, symbolic covenant that we have with Christ. And if you're not part of that covenant, it would be kind of like the renewing wedding vows with somebody who's not your spouse. So that being said, when we come by, just let us know, and we're happy to pray with you or whatever that looks like for you.
Good morning, Christ Community Church. Today's reading comes from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. On one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem, and the Lord's power to heal was in him. Just then some men came, carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since there was no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, Why are you thinking this? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or you say, get up and walk? But to so that you may know the son, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home, glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded, and they gave glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen it today. This is the word of God. Thanks, Tommy. This passage that we have today in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses, it's kind of the thing storybook Bibles are made of, isn't it? Like, this is like, this is like children's Sunday school, church, the good stuff. It's a fun story. Interesting things are happening. And it's easy for us to think that this main story is about the friends who somebody to Jesus. And that is part of the talk about that. But we also have to see, we have to notice that that's not the main topic of this story. But rather the main idea is that Jesus has the power and the authority of sins. So those are the two things that we want to look at this morning. We want to look at the fact that Jesus has the power and the authority to forgive sins, but we also want to look at the fact that true faith, just as these men brought their friends to Jesus, faith should move us to action. Whenever we uh, at a local school and we teach kids how to read the Bible, and one of the rules and one of the techniques we teach the kids is like whenever you're reading scripture, especially with a narrative story, one of the things that you need to do is you need to put yourself into the shoes of the story. So you put yourself you put yourself into the shoes of the people who are bringing the paralyzed friend to Jesus. You put yourself in the shoes of the Pharisees and Jesus. So as you read through the story, you begin to to put yourself into the shoes of the different people in the story, thinking, what would I say? What would I do? How would I react? To look at the story again, and, and I want to begin here, by retelling the story with a, a tell, just so we can begin to think of ourselves in the story. What we're, uh, we're, who was there? What was the room like? So let's go through the story one more time dive into the other two points just to get a feel of the story was growing up that's been the from the get-go hasn't it people hear about jesus come to hear him but then people jesus for it wasn't just because he taught with authority but as this passage says it says that jesus had with him the power of the lord so people wanted to hear Jesus. They wanted to hear his teaching. There was something different about him. But they also wanted to come because we world that was much like our Jason hobbling around. Man, he was back out the other day, too. They were like two for two on, on staff throwing their backs out right now. Broken world, and people wanted to come to Jesus and be. And so when Jesus was in Capernaum teaching in a house, People came out in droves. These, like the big massive room we're in right now, these were these were small houses. In fact, these houses, their roofs were probably only about six foot high. So if you're like six one, six two, you'd be dragging forehead in this house, right? So it's it's a short roof, and the walls were made of stone. 
These were stone. <laughs> Kathy, laughing. <laughs> got to stop it. So these walls were six foot high. And what they did for the roofs is they laid these long wooden beams across these. And in between the beams, they would mix clay and reeds and thorns and brush and clay mixture. And they'd pack it in the roofs. And so you had this stone like ceiling six foot up. And this floor was so solid. It was so sturdy that you could walk on it. So what is they put is on the outside of these stone houses that would lead up to the rooftop. And the rooftop would serve as like a second living area for the people in the house. You were higher up, you could catch the breeze. And so it's a living area up there. So Jesus died on the bottom floor in the ceiling building. And people came out in droves to hear him. In fact, we are told that the Pharisees came out to hear him. They came from and they even came from Jerusalem to hear Jesus. These Pharisees were not priestly people. They were people just like you. They had jobs that they went to during the day. We always hear the story of uh, Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, and people always ask the question, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Probably because he had a day job. Like he, he had, And oftentimes their work as a Pharisee was Sabbath where they would study the law of God of God. Uh, they were a lay ministry, a non-priestly people who really honored the law. They wanted to fulfill the law. Every, every dot of the eye, every cross, follow it perfectly. And when they felt like the law, this is where they began to mess up. When they felt like the law wasn't clear enough, well, they would make it more clear by adding rules to what the law of God said. In fact, the Pharisees agreed on many things. The Pharisees believed the Messiah was going to come into the world. They believed in the resurrection of the dead just as Jesus believed. They believed in a, a kingdom of God coming and being established on earth. The Pharisees believed in all these things just like Jesus did, but they made a very big difference. And their difference. The Pharisees believed that we entered the kingdom of God in our own self-righteousness. They believed the law so perfectly and you could be so holy that God would accept you. And so the, le- the, the Pharisees became the, the fundamentalists and the legalists of that day, believing in a salvation of works. And so they came out to hear Jesus. And I'm sure there's a little bit of curiosity saying, who is this man that we're hearing about? What is he doing? I'm hearing that he's, he's doing miracles. And maybe they wanted to come out and see and hear Jesus because they were like, man, it's on fire. And a, mess, and a messianic kingdom, maybe, maybe he can join in with us. Maybe they went because they wanted to criticize him. If this guy's gaining in popularity, one of us. And maybe we need to investigate his teaching to see if he's actually teaching the word of God. We don't know what their motivation was, but we know for a fact that they came out to sit in this house to hear Jesus with a critical ear. And then we have other people in the story. We have a man who is paralyzed, who is on a mat, who is on a stretcher, who who can't even get near to Christ. So what does his friends do? His friends pick up his mat, they pick up his stretcher, and they bring him to Jesus. Let's just take a right quick and thank God for friends like this. That they did not let a crowd get in their way. They didn't let stone walls get in their way. They didn't let us get their way. But they said, we are going to make sure what, whatever the barrier is, we're going to make sure you get to Christ. And some of you probably have friends like that, a relative like that in your everything they have to do to remove the barriers between you and they push you and they encourage you they rebuke you they correct you why because they they want to get you to cry men didn't let anything of getting their paralyzed friend to jesus i just wonder what it was like 
people inside the room whenever Jesus was teaching. Can you imagine this? Sitting in your chair, or maybe it was so crowded you were just standing in your chair, and all of a sudden you hear footsteps going over you, almost like neighbors in an apartment building, right? People are stomping across the way, and you're like, man, that's, that's awfully rude. And you hear mumbled voices, and all of a sudden you just hear clanking. And you're like, what are they doing up there? Like, like building a it's loud. And then all of a sudden, not only was there loud clanking, but the dust started like falling on you. And you're like brushing it off of you. You're like, what in the world are they doing up there? And then chunks start falling down and daylight breaks through. And then it is above you and slowly this small you grows larger and larger to the where it's just a, a complete removing of the roof. Why? Because these men start lowering stretcher down. And remember, this room. So I wonder how many people door for this stretcher that was coming down. There. And then Jesus, looking at this man on a stretcher, looking at the faces of his friends who are maybe dropping down. this man who's on on a stretcher and he says friend your sins are forgiven seeing their faith understanding their hearts he said your sins are forgiven and all of a sudden jesus perceives something else in the room this was but he was going on the hearts of the pharisees and the scribes grumbling and complaining starting to happen Words like blasphemy coming out. Blasphemy is, is one of the great Old Testament idea that you are disrespecting and dishonoring God's name, that you're defiling God's name. And they believe that Jesus was violating the majesty of God. Why? Because Jesus said that he forgave somebody for sins. Jesus perceiving their thoughts. He's not just language here. He's perceiving then responds to the Pharisees in the room. And he asks the question, which is it? Is it easier to say, son, friend, your, your sins are forgiven? Or is it and It's easier to say, and it's easier to believe, son, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because you don't have to have any physical evidence of it. What's harder is, friend, take up your mat and walk home to a paralyzed man because something visible in their presence has to. So Jesus said, so that you know that I have the power and the authority to forgive sins, I'm not just going to say, friend, your sins are forgiven. I'm going to tell them to get up and go home. And so what happens? The man who was paralyzed, mat, who had to be Jesus, who had to be drawn, then stood up, took his mat, and he went home glorifying God. And we would find that all were in awe. They were struck and even of this man that was before them. Because Jesus had the power not only to heal a body, but he had the power to heal and forgive souls. So let's do two things. First of all, we want to look at the fact that Jesus has the power and the authority to forgive sins. Jesus has the power and the authority to forgive in the room. And they looked at Jesus and they began to accuse him of blasphemy. Why were they accusing him of blasphemy? They accused him of blasphemy because they believed that only God has the power to forgive. And they're actually right in that stance. Only God does have the power to ultimately forgive sin. Listen to what Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17 says. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate. You're slow and faithful love, and you did not abandon the people of Israel. 
Psalm 103, verses 11 through 12 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. As the east is from the west, so far has he removed aggressions from us. What these verses are saying is that God has the power to forgive sins. Even our, our, our prayer of confession in Psalm 32, how joyful are those whose sins are, who are they forgiven by? They are forgiven by God. Christ Community Church, we have a compassionate, we have a, and we have a living God. Don't forget that that is who our God is, because that is not the picture of him today, but rather as a cold and hard God who is bloodthirsty and difficult. But our scriptures teach us something else about him, that he is good, he is forgiving. The Pharisees were right in their belief that can forgive sins, but they were wrong in their estimation because Scripture teaches, teaches us that He is God and that as He has the authority and power to forgive sins, not only because He is God, but He has the authority and the power to forgive sins because He is the one paying the cost for those sins. Listen to the Paul writes, to the church in redemption, blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What is Paul? But that Christ blood to bring to God, that forgiveness of through his work. Christ can forgive because he did the hard work of paying the penalty for those sins. Let's not forget this is not easy. See, in his book, Mere Christianity, writes this, Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. Everyone thinks this is a lovely idea until they something to forgive and it's when we've been wounded and it's been hurt and it's when we've been sent to realize the weight and the difficulty exists within forgiveness you can think of it this way um week of easter i was driving down i was driving down rosewood i was sitting at that stoplight and I was on my phone at the stoplight, right? That's legal, right? On my phone at the stoplight, on, I was talking with a, with a subcontractor, like flies in because I was rear-ended. I was like whacked so hard. I was like, I don't even know where my phone is anymore. <laughs> but so I, I got out of the car and I went back there. It was, it was a and, and I was looking at the back of my car to see what the damage was. And I'm like, all right, new car. Uh, but it's like, no damage. Great. Uh, so that's good. So there's no damage. And so the guy, in the hey, let's go to the neighborhood over there. And we'll do the whole switch insurance cards and all that good stuff. And I went over there and I was inspecting my car a little bit more closely since we weren't in traffic. And I'm like, man, this is, this is great. I don't think there's anything wrong. We can just be done with it. And I'm like, going to try one more thing. So I tried to open my trunk. And it opened. I was like, great. And then I tried to close my trunk, and it wouldn't close. And so I was wounded. This man was at fault. He jammed into me. He did damage. And so now I have an and I can make him pay the debt that he owes. Transgress. And so since he broke the law, I can make him pay for that debt that he owes. Or I can offer him forgiveness. What would forgiveness look like in this scenario? Forgiveness would be me you, I'll go my way, and we'll just leave it there. If I offer forgiveness, 
who's going to pay for my car to get fixed? Well, I am. Forgiveness isn't free. Forgiveness isn't cheap. That is owed still has to be paid, but now it's paid to ascend the gift. Some of you so well because you have been hurt and you've been wounded. And for you to offer forgiveness means you have to do this massive thing. I am not going to give you my hate, and I'm not going to give you my hate, but I'm going to give you forgiveness, but it still comes as Wait, and so you know that forgiveness has a cost. And so when you look at Jesus' power and his authority to heal and to offer forgiveness, forgiveness is not forgiveness is not cheap for Christ. But to offer forgiveness to somebody means that he is penalty in the debt that they owe. Christ paid that penalty. He paid that debt on the cross for us. Because we were all at fault. We had all sinned. But he said, I will pay the debt that is owed on the cross. This forgiveness that Christ offered, we have to realize that forgiveness is based in one cross. It's one through. But how is it received? So Christ did this amazing work on the cross where he paid a penalty. But how do we get from him to you receive that gift of grace? Scripture is teaching us here that the way that this happens is through faith. Not look at the people and say, man, you worked really hard to get to me forgive you rather what he said he saw their faith result of that faith he is applying forgiveness in their lives this is where the pharisees got it wrong they thought i have to be good enough i have to work hard enough to receive the mercy of god but what christ is saying no i have paid debt and that debt you need to receive it in faith it is this trusting and hopeful belief in something these men who took their friends believed they had faith that christ could heal do you think they would go through all that work and they would go through all that awkwardness of knocking a hole in somebody unless they actually believed that their friend could be healed. We receive the work of Christ believe when we trust that his on the cross is sufficient for the forgiveness of my sins. If you think that you can earn your way into heaven, that you can earn the approval of Christ through your work, you are like the Pharisees who say, I'm the Messiah, and I believe in his kingdom to come, and I'm going to work my way. But what he says, he said it in a tweet this week. He said, it is impossible to meet the real Jesus and leave indifferent. When we meet Jesus and we meet him and we give him our trust and we have faith in him and his work, we are different. Like this man who was healed and forgiven by Jesus, he walked out lighter. Not only lighter, lighter in his heart, but other people met Jesus as well. The Pharisees met Jesus. These men who thought that they could earn their way into heaven met Jesus, and they left with a certain sort. They left viewing Jesus as a heretic and an enemy. They would oppose him, and eventually they would him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us be people that look to Jesus for forgiveness, that we trust in his work 
for our forgiveness of sins. And change, but not, not to receive salvation, but of it. That leads us to our second point of what we see in this text, that true faith is a faith. So our actions demonstrate our faith, but they are distinguished from it. Let me say that again. Our actions demonstrate our faith, but they are distinguished from it. These men believed that Jesus could heal their friend. They had faith. They trusted in Jesus. So what did they do? Because of their trust, they ripped a hole in a roof. They had faith, and their faith was active ourselves the question, how is our faith demonstrated in our lives? If we say, I trust in Jesus, my faith is in him, I believe in him, how can that faith be demonstrated in your life? Are you sick by fighting the flesh and the desires of the Are you growing the spirit? Are you striving after holiness? I think one of the things that we need community for it's because other people outside of ourselves to look at our lives and tell us whether or not they can see Christ in us. So one of the reasons we're community in our church and we're distressing community groups and discipleship groups and yesterday we had like a women's fellowship and we had to hang out, popsicle at the park and anything else that alliterates to get people together, we're going to do. Why? Because we believe that to be in relationship with people, you have to be with people. And to be with people, we need to have conversations with people. And there needs to be these reoccurring meetings with people. Why? Because it opens up an opportunity for us to feel comfortable with each other so that we're no longer yes men. Because that's who we want to be, isn't it? We want to be the people who are encouraging and never saying anything. Every now and again, we need somebody in our lives to say, what are you thinking? Like, stop it. Like, why are you telling yourselves these lies? Believe the truth. Believe the gospel. And we need guys who are like that because these are the same people who can look at your life and say, man, I see Christ in you. And I see you growing. And I see you developing. And I see you fighting your sin. And what that is, that's evident lives. Faith was made evident in the lives of the characters in this story because they were a friend to Jesus. One of the ways that faith is demonstrated in our lives is by us working people to Christ. When I put myself I ask myself the question, what would I have done if I, was, if I were the friend and my friend was on his mat, on his stretcher, and he, realized, and he looked up at me and said, Stephen, I hear Jesus is here. Can you help me out? Can you get this? And to be honest, guys, I think fear would probably would have stopped me. And as I began to think about it, I began to come up with all the excuses given go to my friend. I think I would have said, friend, you know, I, I know you're paralyzed and I know Jesus has done these miracles, but you know, it's awfully crowded and I don't think there's any space right now. Maybe I would have said, you know, maybe if we just kind of wait by the road, we can choose the right path and we can catch Jesus on the way out. Maybe you can be seen by Jesus there. Because you know what? I mean, we, we don't even have permission to go into this house. I, I don't even know whose house this is. They might not want us there. Like, I don't know if we should just go up their stairs to their living room. Very presumptuous of us. Man, it, it, like, bang, putting a hole in it. I, I think we might need a permit for that, really. I mean, goodness. And what do we say if we're disturbing them from them hearing Jesus? Because we're going to have to make. And 
and while I was thinking, I'm like, man, that that so describes how and how and how I react. And I began to think, what are some things that keep us from sharing our faith? For me, I think it was a fear of breaking. Like I need to keep the rules, and the rules say that that would not be okay. To I think some of us in here might even think that the reason I don't share my faith is because I'm not allowed, that it's not acceptable in the office or I'm in the army and there are rules against proselytizing or I'm in the schools and we're supposed to separate and the state and all that jazz. And, and I think we have to ask ourselves the question, like, have we actually investigated what the rules are? Like, if you military, what does it mean to proselytize? I know what it doesn't mean. It restricts you from telling people what you're learning in the Bible. It doesn't restrict you from telling people what Christ has done for you. If what it might restrict you from doing is going door to door in the barracks, like that's probably off the table. But how effective is that going to be, anyways, when the option of telling people? has done in your life, when you have the opportunity to, to invite a co-worker to come to church with you. So what do we need to do, if this is us, and we say, you know what, I don't know if I'm supposed to, I think that might be breaking the rules, why don't we spend this week actually investigating the rules? Why don't you go to your teacher, your employee handbook, and you say, all right, what can and can't I do in regards to my faith? Because I bet you can do a lot more than you think you can. Like this bad friend over here who just come up with an excuse because it's... Let's investigate that this week and let's not, let's not keep us from doing it, but let's investigate the rules because, because the gospels... I think another fear is this fear, this fear of rejection that we're so afraid that if we open our mouths and we begin to our faith in Christ, that we might get told no. Hudson Taylor, the great, said that the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. Rather, it's a command to be obeyed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, to demonstrate our faith means that we are obedient Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And what was his last command he gave us? Well, to go, therefore, to all the disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you. Let us not let fear of rejection get in the way of our love and obedience for Christ. I think another fear we have is fear of looking foolish. I'm afraid that if we open, it will sound foolish, like we don't know what we're talking about, or the person might bring up don't have the answer to, and we're like we're like a child who does something really cute, and an adult pulls out a phone. Do that again. I want to catch. And what's a kid gonna do? They're gonna be like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. And we just shut down. Why? Because we're fear, if we're foolish. When what we should be, you know what? It's not like I have to have a whole presence to do this. But one of the things that we can do is just drop light here. and We drop light. We drop truth. And we see how people respond. When he goes fishing. He just doesn't take one bait with him. You know why? Because sometimes the fish don't bite on that bait. So he's got his five, not tackle box, he's got his five-gallon bucket full of other baits that he uses, and he tries till he finds what's attractive to the fish. One of the things that we need to do whenever we are sharing our faith is we see how people respond. Maybe we give glory and glory to God. Man, I thank God for that. And we just drop it there. We don't pursue it, but we just say, I for that. Or, or we might say things like um, we share what we at the moment. Or we share 
reading at the moment. Maybe we meditation. Or maybe you show an act of love and kindness, and when they say thank you, you give glory to God. Whenever we first missionary in the Middle East, and he said the way oftentimes shares the gospel in a culture where it is like quite literally against the law to convert to Christianity. The way that he shares the gospel, he just drops truth out there. He doesn't go into detail about it, but he drops truth statements about Christ, about God out there in natural conversation, and he watches to see how the person responds. This is the question he used. It's quite um, probably inappropriate, which is why I like it, but sticky illustration, and I'm going to use it till the day I die. He said, Stephen, whenever we do this, whenever we just say truth statements about God out there, and we mention God in our normal speech, If somebody is called by God and are being drawn by God, they're going to respond to And if they're not being drawn by God, then they're just going to leave. And he said it's light in a dark room. That when you turn on a light in a dark room, if there is a moth in that room, attract the light. But if there are roaches in the room and you turn on the light, what happens? Man, they scatter out. Now, this is where the part with the roaches, right? So that's, that's where good in the illustration. Throw, let's say throw his goodness and what he's done for us out there. And let's see how that sits Follow up with the question. And their question could be answered with more truth. It can be answered with an invitation. It can become a conversation where people can come to know. But one of the things that we need to remember as we demonstrate sharing the gospel, one of the things that we have to remember is that people are not saved work. People are saved because of your eloquence. People are not saved by your intellect, but rather people are saved because God pulled out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And he can use our poor effort to bring people to himself. Church, let us have faith. Let us chip through the clay and pull seeds and let's else if need be. For the sake of Christ and his kingdom and for the souls of men and women, let's stand and pray. Jesus, you are, you are kind. You are compassionate. You are patient and you are forgiving. Father, glory and delight in who you are. We praise your name. We ask your aid as we demonstrate our faith to share that good news with others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Those who dwell within the shelter of the strength and fortress in him my trust surely from the foulest snare with his feathers he will come 
should defend. Find your constant refuge in the shadow of his will. Fullness will be your shield and rampart in all things. All right, Christ Community for Church. Don't forget, if you are wanting to go to that next step luncheon, it's at my house at like 12 15. Uh, I can text you the address if you wanted to come. It was an RSVP thing, but I always buy so if you want to go, just let me know. And I bet we got food and a chair for you. Um, all right, for our benediction, Christ Community Church, you have met the real Christ, the forgiving, the compassionate, the love. You've been changed. Without the people who've been changed by the living God, given. So let us, let us forgive as we have done this week. You are dismissed. Listen, listen right there. I know. I was trying.